All right, we are live. It is the ASPNet community stand up, and we thought this thing wouldn't happen. We had unbooting computers and BIOS hackery and all kinds of stuff going on. So, wow. So, we got Alon Lipton, we got James Montemagno, we have amazing Blazor bindings, mobile, experimental, what have you going on. Um, with, I think, the two best people to talk about it, which is super cool. Um, so, yeah, wow. How did you get the computer to boot? It's a great question. Well, it, you know, we came in, I was like, you know, I want like, it's going to take me five minutes. He's like, I'm going to get there early. Don't worry. I was like, dude, I was in here last week. No problem. You leave Studio <laughs> C a, a vacant for two days. It all goes crazy. The place crazy. is haunted, man. So there's, I swear it's haunted. There's 14 USB thumb drives stuck into this computer. We boot it up. It won't go into BIOS. There's, you know, it, it won't det messages. it detects two hard drives, but refuses to boot anything. Yeah, nothing. And then we have this wireless keyboard that doesn't work because it's wireless and it hasn't booted the USB drivers yet. So this guy goes, he, I don't know where, I don't even know where he magically got a wired keyboard somewhere. I, I it was in his back pocket. Fell, fell off the back of a truck. What do you know? <laughs> fell off the back of a truck. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, somehow we got it working. High five. Yeah. Boom. Wow. Boom. Yeah. He yeah. Just oh. kept, James just kept pressing F2 on a physical keyboard eventually. <laughs> Eventually, well that, that's actually it was it was a consistent was f2 delete yeah. combination over and over you know when you start up your computer you're like what is the bios key combo that they put in is it, it like is it f8 or f12 or yeah this has got to be standardized yeah, yeah. The, so the government has to step in so standardize we, this it booted up we it booted up right and this is before the the successful boot and it goes into a windows installation yeah please choose your mm -hmm. language and i go no turn country. off yeah. get out of here i start ripping all the usb six out of there I was like, get out of here you and they're all they're all flung all over the place so it's great that, i'm that, telling you that's, that's if our anybody morning. wants like a windows 10 usb boot disc right uh, usb thumb drive or or a dozen of them we they're they're like in a right. pile over there they're so. big 32 well, 32 gigs you can yeah. put a lot of stuff it's on nice. there it's nice. but, i'm telling you some evil force did not want this show to happen because that's what happened on your end on my end Friday, I think we finalized, like, yes, the show's totally, ha or like as of end of last week, we, totally happening. We had you on, James, and everything, start promoting. Friday night, I get massive food poisoning. I'm finally, like, back on my feet as of this morning. I, like, lost the whole weekend due to just lying in bed, thrashing around in agony. Oh, no. So, oh, no. I I think it was the same, like... It's some sort of curse. Some some evil force did not want this show happening. But we made it happen, and it's totally it happen. Down. It's happening. Yes. Hey, why don't I show off some community links? Yeah, let's do it. On that note. Yes, because <laughs> I've got a lot of them, and I want to get through them really fast. So I'm going to talk fast. All right. No, don't fast. talk. Take your time. You don't need to. You gotta... I know. I let's know, be honest. I... Ron over here has like nothing prepared. So. No, not really. I yeah. Don't think so. I've got 38 okay. slides. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So first of all, Andrew Locke's got two of them this week. Uh, one, he's talking about excluding health check endpoints from Serilog. So with Serilog, you've got, um, you know, it, it, it's structured logging. Um, and as he points out, if you include health checks in there, it can get pretty verbose. Call it quite a bit. There's, I mean, depending on how you're doing your, your startup probes and everything, there, there's, there can be quite a bit. So what he points out is that you can, in Serilog, you have this enriched diagnostic uh, content, and there's actually a way that you can override that. So they have a default uh, level, but you can create a custom log level as well. By the way, do these like nested indented ternaries turn your head like they do mine. I'm just kind of like, okay, if it's not this, I'm just, uh, anyhow. So, I think it's um, beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Well, it's good. let's agree to, to disagree on that. <laughs> I, I disagree. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, there's a lot going on there. So, um, uh, so anyways, he goes in and he says, hey, we can match on the, the default for a health check. Endpoint is called health checks. And, you know, he says you can go over, you can customize this if you want. Um, but he basically has something that, that checks for that and then uses that in, in the health check logger. And so then he says, we can go ahead and exclude the health checks. Um, so, um, so anyhow, that's, it's just nice pointing out that in the logging that you can go through in Sarah logs logging, you can go through and you can customize to that level. So pretty cool. 
Another one, this is some crazy hackery. He had somebody ask him a question of how you can insert middleware between steps in in, in other middleware. So for instance, with the, the standard middleware now, you've got routing and use endpoints. So use routing and use endpoints, you've got to insert some things between the two for them to work correctly. For instance, you've got to do use authentication and use authorization. They need to be done in a certain order. You have to be authenticated before you can be, be authorized, and that has to happen before the endpoints, et cetera. So what he ended up doing is, um, and I'll mention later in the comments, he's not, you know, he's like, well, this, there may be other things to look at here, but he looked at the analysis middleware. So there's this ASP.NET Core analysis middleware package, and the way it works is actually inserting itself in between every single piece of middleware. And it does that so it can a analyze stuff. So what he ended up doing was doing something similar and basically no opping unless he was the last in the line. So he's inserted himself everywhere in the process uh, between every bit of middleware. And he only, if it's, if the next middleware is use endpoints or is endpoint middleware, then he actually executes something. So. That is a way to, for an app, so if you're building a library and you want to be able to do something like this, you can say, you can tell people just do services.add. You don't need to do an app.use and I'll just magically insert myself in here. So that all sounds like kind of works, a little bit hacky. And then, um, as somebody pointed out in the comments, they're like, well, wait a minute, what happens if um, several libraries do that? Is Are they all gonna work? And and yeah, it does look like that's not really necessarily the best. This is great if only Andrew Locke does this, but if a lot of people do this, it might be a problem. So I don't know if there's a better idea. It's an interesting thing, and it at least pointed out the flexibility that you have with something like the analysis middleware where it inserts itself in between every single one. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. <laughs> Inter yeah. Very interesting read, anyhow. <laughs> so this is why I'm a mobile cool. developer. I don't have to worry about. There it. you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, Scott Brady uh, posts about Identity uh, Manager two 2020 update. So this is a developer uh, UI for managing identities. You can go. This is uh, updated for ASP.NET Core three one. Same site cookie, some other stuff. Um, so uh, the nice that this is available there's also th this is they point out if you if you you know click through to it that identity identity manager 2 is not intended for a deployment like in an enterprise scenario and there's actually a a productized version of this that is so that's cool all right a few from gunner peatman so uh first of all uh one here on creating fake users for asp.net core integration tests so he talks about how you know how you would create a user uh then he follows it up so um i don't want to spoil too much here because i think the next is actually more kind of interesting he talks about injecting both the users and roles into integration tests and so he talks about what what he needs to do th with that uh creating a uh, test on th authentication handler and kind of the, the payoff to all this is then he's creating role-based integration tests. So here he, he shows his, uh, you know, his, his test service, and then he's going through and he's saying, okay, if I've got an anonymous user, I want to make sure that I get a redirect on all requests and, you know, using multiple inline data with XUnit. Uh, and then he's saying, okay, if I am authenticated, I want to be able to see details but I shouldn't be able to edit, so that should be forbidden. And then uh, if I'm you know, a test auth user, so if I have admin claims, then I should be able to edit and, and view details. So I, I think that's you know, nice to be able to have those integration level tests to be able to do that. So um, that's cool. One more from Gunnar, uh, and I, I'm, I'm kind of highlighting Gunnar. He's he's been uh, blogging steadily about ASP.NET for years and years, and uh, so I, I'm just uh, kudos to to you, Gunnar. Um, so he also did a nice kind of roll up on 
.NET Conf focus on Blazor. So this was a nice kind of overview of all the stuff that was announced there. So I, I know there have been you know a lot of uh, Blazor posts overall, but this was kind of a nice kind of wrap up just of that event specifically. Good stuff. Okay, uh, Eric Anderson. So he pointed out uh, that you could generate, you could use NSWAG to generate a view client from an ASP.NET Core 3.1 API. So the idea is you've got uh, ASP.NET Core 3.1 API, you can use NSWAG, and then he also uses NSWAG Studio. Then he uses that to grab a TypeScript client and then using that TypeScript client, he's got a, he's uh, you know using that with a full API front, a view API front end. So uh, I'll show you the source code he links to. This is what you get away from having to write. This is the whole TypeScript front end, including all the API fetching and all that stuff, as well as the, the mapping and and stuff of um, you know back and forth of the models. So that's kind of handy. Um, so. Nice tip there. Okay, uh, Damian Bowden, here he's talking about ASP.NET Core certificates. So this is a nice NuGet library he's created. It's a certificate manager for creating and managing uh, certificates. So he has some examples, uh, both of creating certificates among a bunch of different stuff, and he points out Azure IoT is a good scenario, but also development certificates for you know for spas and then he also has examples of using certificates including some more complicated things like uh, chain certificates so i'm not a super certificate security person but i retweeted this and people seem to go crazy on twitter and really loved it so it seems like it's an important thing so interested in the comments if, if people are happy about that okay uh shahed here he's keeping up his A through Z series, uh, and he's talking about deploying ASP.NET Core 3.1 to Azure App Service. So this includes a lot of stuff, the kind of standard scenarios, and of course the right-click publish uh, scenarios. Uh, he also talks about going through the portal, talks about uh, selecting different runtimes, using Deployment Center, and also using GitHub repos. So, uh, you know, quite, quite a bit here. I, I love how Shahed goes through and does very thorough kind of roll-ups of a lot of different options. So it's not just like, here's one small thing. It's like the thing. It's, he's, he's writing the book on each of these things. So keeping with deployment and Azure here, we're looking at troubleshooting ASP.NET Core 500 errors. Um, so first of all, Sam points out that you can go in and and there is documentation, as he points out in this, in the, the docs, uh, that will point you to going into Kudu in the debug console and just running right there, and you'll find out something. In this case, Key Vault didn't have access to something. Um, so then he goes through and, and actually points out that you can uh, you can capture those errors, and it's set to um, first. You'd need to do capture startup errors to true, but then actually, when you're deployed to Azure, it's going to ignore that because you're not in release. So then he talks about if you really want to capture that in Azure, you can go through. You can set an environment variable. You can set um, things up so that you basically have an environment in Azure for development and you can actually capture and see those errors so nice kind of more in-depth look I, i've definitely gone through the how to troubleshoot those errors and and you know run it in kudu and here's here's the look at you know error handling um but but nice to kind of see more in depth if you actually want to see those errors in azure all right moving on to some blazer, blazer stuff uh, so michael washington talking talking about embedding power bi in blazer so it looks like a pretty good common scenario. Um, and Gunnar Peatman, again with the Gunner, uh, he had written up something about uh, embedding in a .NET Core application. And so what Michael Washington's walking through is in embedding in Blazor as well. Um, what I think is neat with this is just Blazor in general is kind of an, uh, I would think, you know, a nice sweet spot for, for Blazor is these uh, line of business applications. And so being able to embed Power BI into that seems like a pretty natural fit. 
today, more with the Blazor. So we've got Mika posting on hosting Blazor applications in GitHub pages. So this is, you know, GitHub WebAssembly can run completely, its static files can run completely in the browser. And so because of that, you could host it in GitHub pages. However, you can run into some things because the routing, if you copy, uh, you know, if I copy a URL and, and send it over to you, the routing's not necessarily going to work on the, it's not going to work on the first run. Um, and so you need to do things like handle custom 404s. And so there's ways that you can set that up. And he actually uh, went through and created a uh, simplified solution that does all that. So he basically included the 404s um, and, and stuff in a sample application. So that's kind of nice. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, you could you could use his sample application. And you know, here's here it is running in in uh, GitHub Pages, and it's it's doing the kind of standard GitHub Pages stuff. I mean, the uh, Blazor application stuff. So it's kind of neat. Okay, we're in the home stretch. First of all, today Blazor WebAssembly 3.2 Preview One now available. So some of the neat stuff. Um, uh, we've got simplified startup. So, you know, this is simplified for things that are important for Blazor applications and removing things that are not. Um, there's also download size improvements. So this includes the uh, code trimming for the application. So it actually trims the Blazor framework assemblies as well. So saves you another 100K, which is nice. And also support for the .NET SignalR client. So this is in Blazor WebAssembly. You can use .NET SignalR client to call back to the server or call to another server. So good stuff. We also have from James Newton King. Uh, this is the uh, gRPC services, calling gRPC services from the browser with gRPC web. So in the past, so the issue you run into is gRPC is it requires HTTP2, and there's no browser API that yet supports that and supports all the HTTP2 stuff you need for gRPC. And so there have been some solutions that use proxies, um, but but the cool thing here is this example doesn't, or this, this new support doesn't require a proxy. So the things he calls out, the new opportunities you have is you can call gRPC apps from the browser directly without a proxy. Um, so from like a JavaScript spa or from Blazor web app, you can also host ASP.NET Core gRPC apps in Azure or App Service. And currently we're blocked on doing that because IIS in ASP.NET Core doesn't support gRPC because we don't have all the HTTP2 support. So this is cool. You can support, you can run ASP.NET Core in IIS or Azure and get support for gRPC through gRPC web. And then finally calling gRPC from .NET Core, from non-.NET Core platforms as well. Um, so he goes through and shows off uh, the, the, how you would set that up, which is what's neat here is basically it's pulling in a package, uh, gRPC.ASP.NETCore.web, and then just adding this override, enable gRPC web. That's pretty slick. And then on the client as well, Pretty easy to do this. So th this is all you'd need to do from from uh, you know JavaScript to call back into the thing. So there you go. Uh, so as always, these are all going to be in the show notes and and published out, and uh, I'll put them out in the chat. And the last link I have is this. This is the announcing experimental mobile Blazor binding. So this is what. Uh, Alon, you posted right during the uh, Blazor, the mighty day of Blazor thing that we yeah. just had. Fo yeah. Focus on Blazor.net competition Focus 2020. Focus on Blazor. Yeah, there you go. Ago, weeks ago today. There you go. So with that, I think I am ready to turn it back over to you folks. Do, 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 do. I did my best to talk fast. See, I had a thousand links. You did. I mean, it's been a while. When was the last time you had, <laughs> there was an ASP.NET community stand-up? Like November? So we had one last week, oh. but I didn't have all a ton of links for it. So this one was kind of making up for that one. Got it. Got it. Okay, Got perfect. It. Like great content, yeah. And yeah, people, of course, can go to live.net and then you can get the links there. I, we did just find a bug in the website where the video is not playing. I've already reported it to the team. Oh my so gosh. Someone did not URL encode a string and that 
is the issue, I believe. So uh, I'm blaming it on JavaScript. You can, you can blame it on me because I worked on ASP.NET for long <laughs> enough. It's probably some, you know, there you go. hidden yeah. bug in there, yeah. like the one change. There's they probably let an me update make. panel somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. what, what I think you just didn't see was that beautiful joke that I just made. What's that? See, I just blame it on JavaScript. Uh, yeah, we should, uh, yeah. What if we didn't have to write? What's this JavaScript, JavaScript language? <laughs> yeah, you speak of. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh, so I'm just here just for to answer questions, really, just to be honest with you. I'm, not, I'm here just because I had to figure out how to get the computer going. Yeah, I would, I would have been <laughs> hey, dead in the water <laughs> without James. And, uh, John and I will be monitoring the chat room as well. But yeah, uh, maybe people don't, I don't know if anyone, everyone watched the chat. So maybe you just want to kind of introduce yourself a little bit, give a little bit of a background and then uh, yeah, absolutely. go into it. Yeah, uh, for sure. So uh, I'm Elon Lipton, I'm an engineer. Uh, at a on the .NET team at Microsoft. And uh, some people might know me from my work on ASP.NET. I worked on ASP.NET since before it was called ASP.NET. And I'm not just talking about ASP.NET Core. Oh, hey, are people hear me now? See how I it's, am. Uh, too, too, too close. There you go. That's great. That's perfect. This, this is how I podcast. You got to get real close to the mic. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Let's sip a cup of coffee. Yep. A cup of tea. Yeah, well, it, does, it doesn't work if you actually it low. Scaling? Something in my mind, something reminds me of this word scalene. Was that a code name from was, a thousand yeah, years ago? M M MVC, that's right, John. That's right. It, it doesn't work if you if you if you lower your audible level and get closer to the mic. Oh, yeah, this is, this is, <laughs> okay, like, let me let's, get let's get serious. Let's get serious. Okay. Yeah. So um, okay. I worked on ASP.NET for a very 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 long time, uh, uh, more than a decade and a half, including uh, MVC and update panel and web forms and grid controls and data sources and .NET Core and ASP. .NET Core and lots of really great things. And uh, more recently, I uh, decided to kind of uh, take some of those skills, some of my experience building uh, platforms for web developers and try to apply some of those things uh, for people who want to build native mobile apps using .NET, Visual Studio, and C Sharp. And that's where this experimental mobile Blazor bindings project uh, kind of came from, is could we kind of take advantage of the really great tech behind Blazor and target native mobile apps using the tech that builds Xamarin Forms. In fact, it's built on top of Xamarin Forms, merging those two technologies, and uh, see what we could do. And so two weeks ago at .NET Conf colon focus on Blazor, we did, that's, that's cool. what it's called. That's what it's called. We okay. get in trouble that's if we don't call it that. That's true, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we uh, released a, kind of a preview of that on Nougat.org, got a lot of great feedback on that from customers. And in the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, going through a lot of that feedback, chatting with James and David uh, Ortnow and some other folks, uh, kind of learn from customers, see what do people think about it? What would they like to see next? Is it something they would like to use? Is it something that's not interesting uh, at all? And uh, it's been two weeks now, and so I wanted to share a little bit about uh, what I've been up to those last two weeks. So it sounds like how you pitch it here is is if you're an existing ASP.NET developer, maybe you like the Razor syntax of Blazor model, you can build mobile apps. Else, the option today is go use something else um, and go learn something else, or stay in C Sharp, learn Xamarin, which you still have now two cognitive loads, or get closer, right? Because from my understanding, like it, it's very similar to sort of how there's React and React Native, which is like different, right? They're similar models, but different yep. components. Same programming model, different components. components. And, that's, and that's what Blazor, the Blazor Mobile Bindings is to the Blazor that a lot of people already know uh, with HTML. Got it. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so uh, can we switch to my uh, I could do whatever you want. HDMI. I don't know which one was it. Two, I one. I don't know. Two. One, two, three. It'll, be, four, it'll either be a, five. oh, there it is. Oh, oh there it is. Oh, look, everybody, it's PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, I love PowerPoint. Uh, so not really about slides, but I just wanted to, to share a couple things because um, it's, it's kind of easier to do it this way, is uh, if you have not had a chance to really play around at all with experimental mobile Blazor bindings, please check out the video from .NET Con from two weeks ago. Just go to YouTube, search mobile Blazor bindings. That's it's, it's the top uh, result for that as of this recording. I'm sure that will change over time. Uh, but go check that out. I, I did notice that apparently I'm wearing exactly the same shirt uh, as I was back nice. then. Yeah. So I, I do. It's own... been two weeks. It's okay. Yeah. I, I mean, it's been two weeks. It's been two weeks. Yeah. If it was yeah. like four days, it's. Sketchy, I, mean, I mean, you might have just done laundry. It's possible. That's like your special shirt. That's your like going on stage shirt. Um, mm. it, it might be. I, I made this shirt. So it's, it's, it does it's, have your name on oh, it. Nice. It has my whole family. Oh, wow. It's a whole except, family except shirt. Except new, my newborn's names. He, he doesn't. He can't read. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. 
Uh, so yeah, so uh, please check out that video if you haven't already. Um, and then just to really capture the essence of uh, experimental mobile blazer bindings, it enables you to build native mobile apps for iOS and Android using VS, C Sharp, .NET, and Blazor. So that's kind of the, the, the pitch line, the elevator pitch, if you will, uh, for that. Um, so what I wanted to, oh yeah, just for people who uh, haven't seen this before, Blazor for the web, this is a slide from, from that talk. This is the only slide I've copied from, from that in terms of real content. This is what it looks like with HTML and C Sharp. So you have your, your, uh, your code in C Sharp, you have your HTML that hooks up event handlers and so forth. With mobile blazer bindings, instead of HTML, you have these mobile UI components, and I'll show how those work. Uh, and just actually, we'll write a new one, and we they run natively on Android and iOS. So you can code that up instead of a, a div. You have a stack layout, and you have a label and a button. But the C sharp code is the same. The pattern is the same pattern that you see in every Blazor application, regardless of whether it's WebAssembly running on ASP.NET Core, or in this case, running on your iOS or Android device. And then you run the app, and, and that's what it looks like. So what's what's been going on uh, in the last two weeks? Well, we got a question here already. Oh yeah, let's so go to the question. Do. Yeah. So if you go let's back to it. the last slide. Oh yes, is the stack layout? So Electric was uh, asking, well, probably maybe you can define like what are these things, right? Yeah. And then what is the stack layout and why is that required? Yeah. Um, so I can I can uh, answer the question with a question: is, is a div required in HTML? Mm. And uh, you you could try to argue both ways. Well, I don't need it. The browser will render if I don't put a div, but it's not valid. In the browser case, you have to have not necessarily a div, but you have to have some kind of container that controls the layout of things to some degree. So you can think of stack layout kind of like a div in HTML, but this one is mobile and it has similar things. Is it is, do you want it to be horizontal or vertical? Um, and there, there's other options. You don't have to use a stack layout. There's lots of other containers that James uh, can tell you all about. Mm -hmm. um, and so you don't have to use a stack layout, but you do need some kind of container and there are many uh, from which you can choose for the mobile uh, the mobile world that makes sense especially on mobile devices which is sometimes the layout it's a little bit different in terms of screen orientation and, and device sizes gotcha yeah I'll continue through and I'll try to I will try to so so yeah there, there seems to be some questions here about like why wouldn't you use maybe like a layout manager element or some other things from the web because it's not the web elements correct that's correct. Yeah, these are not web elements. These are these are native. Uh, either they're layout components or they're native uh, elements. For example, the label and the button. This will be a, you know a UI kit. I don't remember what it's called in iOS or Android, but a UI kit label and a UI button. Uh, you know, depending on whether it's on Android, uh, iOS, or also UWP uh, mm -hmm. as well, which uh, apparently works just fine with mobile blazer binding. Yeah, Katrin. Uh, I'm going to say I always say everybody's names wrong, but uh, I was asking. Like, hey, if I'm already doing, you know, ASP.NET, .NET Core web development, um, you know, maybe done some Blazor, what should I should I go with, right? What should I do? Well, these are experimental bindings, right? They're not even, it's not even a product at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And th what you're seeing here in this screen, well, I love this screen. This is the screen that I was like, you got to put this screen on, is that it's the same Blazor model, right? So you're using your injection, like your the pattern, everything, and when we get to the code, you'll see it all works the same. And in fact, I think that text block there really describes it when you see text, you press count times is very different because that's the blazer razor syntax, the blazer that's razor, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. This is the thing that you'd be used to. Now, all the controls are the components, if you will, are Xamarin components. They're, they're mobile components. Don't even think of them as Xamarin components, even though they are, but they're just mobile components that you would be using, and that's different than a website. So you'd have your web UI and then you'd have your mobile UI here, but it's the same, you know, paradigms yep. from understanding what you're saying. If I was to reiterate Absolutely. exactly what you just said. Yes, but using more words. Yeah. From, from with exactly with more words. From a Xamarin perspective, at least. Yeah. So that's what I'm here for, is the Xamarin perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I guess the other thing is yeah. you could you could create more elements, right? Right now there are no like web elements, there's no div, right? You couldn't just shove a div mm -hmm. in here. Yeah, absolutely. And so th this type of feedback is exactly what we want to look for. Is like, what yeah. is what do people who are at least, uh, are people even considering this as an option? In which case we want to have kind of an appropriate answer for you. Like, yes, this actually, based on what you already know, all your skills that you have, mm -hmm. we think actually this would be a, a great option for you. Or, you know what, what you have works for you already and you're happy with it, stick with what you have. Do you use XAML with Xamarin Forms? and you're super happy with it and you like all the features you get, like hot reload and all the great features, wonderful. 
keep keep using that. We're not trying to convert anybody or anything. We just think there's another kind of compelling option here that might be uh, underserved today for a lot of .NET developers. Yes, but yeah, if you're coming from a web background, it makes complete sense. I mean, I remember John and I, we built the, the, the stand-up website together and it was mm-hmm. it was different. Like it was, John knew everything about Razor syntax, right? But when I came to it and started doing it, I was like, I have no idea. I'm so confused. And then the, the because just the model is different. I finally got it, but I was happy in my XAML and VVM world. And when John went over to that world, it, you know, it, it was different. There's some like, similarities. Uh, wow, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. And fundamentally, John's a web developer. I'm a. I'm a I'm I kept cool. typing some code and refreshing, and, and nothing would. I was like, no, you, you know, like I just didn't. I, I had a different workflow, kind of. Oh. As well, and I think that's part of what you're pointing out a little bit here is like. So you've got the different kind of you've got the different controls, you know, but the the kind of the benefit or the simple thing to integrate here is if Blazor syntax makes sense to you, then the kind of the bindings here of how you like how you integrate with your code with those bindings is kind of more of that flow, right? Yeah, and I don't think I said that in, in English actually, but yeah, so they're. they're um... What you said is, is definitely true. It's 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 the way you kind of integrate the C sharp logic and uh, bindings with right. the elements that's uh, very different from other some other systems. But for somebody who has done Razor or Blazor, looks completely natural. Like, mm-hmm. well, of course I do it this way. Of course, if I want to for loop, this is how I do it to render a list. Right. Of course, if I want to have a two way binding, this is how I do it. This is what seems natural to to some people. Certainly not to all developers, but. We think there's a, a, a case to be made for um, having something like this, so that's why I mean, it, it's got experiment in the name. It's, it's we're trying something out. We don't we don't know what it should look like, but we have some ideas. Nice. Cool. Cool. All right. There's some conversation in the chat, so we'll continue on. Do you like that fancy animation? I made that happen. That's, that's amazing. It yeah, is. it's amazing. Cool. Uh, <laughs> So what's new since .NET Conf? So first of all, thank you community for some really great pull requests. I've already merged in, I think, uh, three community pull requests, which was great uh, to see that. Uh, some folks fixed some uh, bugs, uh, improved uh, the, the project for people who have .NET Core 3.1 only installed mm-hmm. to make sure that you can build the project. If you don't have .NET Core 3, that's wonderful. So thank you to everybody from the community. There's a couple more pull requests uh, from the community that I'm uh, taking a look at. I was rejiggering a whole bunch of things so I had to kind of take a break from community pull requests to, to work on a few other things uh, and then I'll get right back to that uh, uh, this week and kind of start working on some of those so thank you to everybody uh, who also logged issues and joined in in the conversation and so that's that's what we were looking for and so that was really great that in, in, in just two short weeks uh, we got kind of a lot of action from from the community uh, one of the things that I want to show uh, right now is um, how uh, how to add additional components. So Xamarin Forms offers uh, several dozen, I don't even know how many, 50 or 60 uh, components, uh, or maybe more, I'm not sure. It's a lot. Um, yeah. In the box? Yeah, in, in the box. It's ever growing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we just shipped like three brand new ones. Yeah, and they're all super crazy customizable. Yeah, 50, 60 at this point now. Sounds about right. Yeah, I think so. Um, and so I just did the noise and audio for everybody, so let me know how it is, Michael. I got you. I saw, I saw comments coming in. Wonderful. So. Um, and so to make those com- Xamarin Forms, those rich Xamarin Forms components available to people using the mobile Blazor bindings, they have to be wrapped. Now, this was a completely manual process, which uh, not only was somewhat tedious, was also, as it turns out, very error prone. And so uh, despite my efforts, I, I had some typos and I messed a few things up. And so uh, some folks uh, on the team here, as well as I think in the community, suggested, well, why not have a a generator, and I, I kept poo-pooing the idea, saying, "Ah, it's too complicated." Well, at one a.m. this morning, everybody in the house was asleep, and I was furiously typing away. And if you don't believe me, check the <laughs> check the commit on GitHub. Uh, so it was just, just before one a.m. Uh, this morning, uh, I, I finished writing the generator and replaced uh, all the parts that are replaceable in the handwritten code with generated wow. code. And the idea being is that, uh, well, I only, because I was manually writing all the components, I you know, could only write so many because I had to work on other things as well. Well, with a generator, when it comes time to add an additional component, it's uh, just a few clicks. And so I want to show what that looks like. And um, I'll be going through kind of all the missing components. And so the, the component generator takes in uh, this text file, 
where you list all the components that you, all the Xamarin Forms components that you want to create wrappers for. Um, some of them are commented out because like the element is, is the base uh, component in the Xamarin Forms world. That, mm. That's one's a little special because it's, it's like the object base class, if you will. So you don't want to auto-generate that because it's, it's a little special. Uh, and then some components are just uh, a little too complicated for me to auto-generate, so I, I, I'm, I'm avoiding those. But um, just earlier, I added progress bar here. So progress bar is not something that's available in the current preview, but I added this progress bar line here, and then I can uh, run this generate command that runs, uh, .NET runs this command line tool and creates some output in a folder. And so it's going to run, it's going to scan all these components, blah, 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 generating, you know, templated view, templated page, blah, blah, blah. Somewhere up there is progress bar. And so if we look at this output folder, here's all this generated code. You can tell it's generated because all the file names say dot generated. Dot generated. I see what you did yeah. there. Yeah. No, it's amazing. Uh, and so here we have this progress bar dot generated. And there's also this thing called a handler. Uh, I'm not going to go into too many details right now, but this is progress bar handler dot generated. And what I've already done uh, ahead of time, you're just like in the cooking show, it's like, oh, it's all the cake is baked in the oven. There it is. Zoom, zoom in that font for me. 160. Boom. There Bigger. we go. Bigger. Whoa. Perfect. That's great. Whoa. <laughs> I always like to remind people people are on their mobile phones. So Whoa. that's how I watch back this video. Is somebody watching this on their mobile phone? We I hope probably, so. Yeah. Probably. Hey, pull, pull, pull that up. Maybe. I, I watch .NET Conf on my mobile phone. I mean, it's, wow. you know, okay. I mean. Yeah. I'm just saying. Well, he's probably one of those people who has like his he uses like an iPad as a mobile phone and you know makes phone calls, <laughs> takes pictures. Listen, with an iPad. Pictures, T-Mobile yeah. gives me unlimited 480p streaming. So, I'm gonna find. <laughs> well, that, okay, 480p. See? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> Fahad is in in the chat. See, thank you. Oh, and Alan okay. is on there. See, we got okay. ah. See, I'm right. Wonderful. I knew oh, it, James. Oh, another person. I knew it. I will never doubt you. Well, that's with a winky though. From my mo from my mobile to my TV. Oh, interesting. Whoa. So well, kind of your TV. Yeah. That's cool. Um, that could be so it could be a CRT. It could be a CRT TV for all we know. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, here are those generated files, and they contain uh, things like the various properties that a progress bar has, like what is the current progress, what color should it be. And then uh, additional functionality that kind of maps everything from the Blazor component to the Xamarin Forms uh, kind of native content. This that is all created. done automatically. Yeah, this code is, you, is generated. You used to write this manually. I wrote all this manually like an for dozens. Yeah, like an animal for wow. dozens of components. And, wow. And not only that, I kept getting it wrong. Wow. So we and need to be replaced by machines. So you're figuring this out by scanning the types and like reading, like yeah. just doing reflection kind of stuff. Yeah, that's that's, that's exactly right, John. So you can monitor the seal. Uh, no, so it, it's it's using just reflection to to oh, scan okay. everything, and then it's just kind of manually code genning using a lot of string concatenation because mm. I, I wanted it to look a very particular way. Um, Could have used maybe something like Rosalind to generate the code, but mm. eh, I didn't want to have to yeah. learn you know one yet another yet another thing. One in the morning. Yeah, some other morning at 1 a.m. Uh, <laughs> when the kids are like, uh, you know, uh, screaming or something. Um, and so, okay, so we, we've now imported these and now I can start using this, uh, start using this uh, in, in my uh, sample application. So now we so see this. This is the same app you had earlier with the buttons. Yeah, this is uh, almost exactly the same code. It's basically uh -huh. the same thing here. I think somebody in the chat asked earlier, can you do like at inject in here? Absolutely, you can do at inject. This is this is a razor file. You can do at inject and you can get services from your dependency injection container. In can I get an HTTP client? Uh, you can get an HTTP client in here as well. That's a, yeah, absolutely. Bananas. It's monkey love bananas. You I have that. a monkey. Uh, so here we could do something like uh, get a progress bar, and we could set its current progress to something like uh, zero point five, and set its color uh, progress color to I don't know what's a what's a good color. Red. Red. Wow, oh, mm. what made you think of red? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> What am I wearing? Uh, red. red. Uh, so, okay, that's cool. Now we've got a progress bar on there. Uh, we can make it a little bit more interesting. We could say that uh, instead of just a static value, we can use our razor syntax and say, let's take the current uh, counter value that's on this page and divide it by, let's say, 100 mm -hmm. uh, and get, get a value uh, out of that. So as you click the button, you'll get a progress bar. Uh, let's go ahead and get that uh, running, see that it, my emulator. I changed screen resolutions. Click game. The, this is called a click game. What's I don't know if you ever played those games where you click and oh. cookies or whatever. Yeah, this is, you've just yes, created this that. Yes, this is this is. Uh, I'm going to upload this to the App Store <laughs> and make make dozens of of cents. So uh, there's it's a little hard to see. There's a, there's a progress bar here, but as I, as I click on it, we get the what do you know a red progress Why? bar. Can you uh, can you debug that? Can you can you debug? Yeah, that? absolutely. Uh, but let's let's debug it in just a second because what I want to do is add uh, some uh, fancy fancy stuff to it. Okay. Uh, so let's say I want to do some 
animations. I like animations. Animations. You love animations. In fact, the first time that I saw this, I you said, created How do I? that whole sh- sh- animation every time the screen yeah. changes. <laughs> yeah, I think so. it made me. It made me sick because he he made basically the whole screen like flip around, do a 360 uh, every time. Uh, people don't know, but the actual the room moves when that's happening as well. Yeah, yeah actually, the the, the 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 phone stays still, and yeah. it's just the room moves. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do here is uh, I want to get a direct reference to this element here. So if you if you're familiar with Blazor syntax, I can define this uh, field here that is of the correct type, and then I can use this at ref, which is kind of a, mm-hmm. a, a Blazor syntax here, and say I want to capture a reference to this progress bar into this variable. So it's sort of, uh, you're saying it links them together? Exactly. So I can actually have a reference to that. It's kind of like, huh. uh, just like you might use like X name yeah. in uh, XAML or um, in, again, in Blazor, this is how it works, or in web forms, you might have like an ID of some sort. Uh. And so let's say I want to like have a button where I can uh, just complete the the um, the progress bar like instantly. And so I'm going to have actually make it an async task. We're going to have an async method, complete. And uh, now I want to go to this uh, progress element. Now this is a Blazor component, but from the Blazor component, I can get to the native control. So this gives me direct access to the Xamarin Forms element that's created there. And then there's uh, what's it called? There's some kind of like progress, progress, yep. progress two. And so I'm going to do something like progress to like ten thousand, which I found kind of to make anim- some of the animations uh, look nice. I, I don't know. Choose some like random easing option. I don't know, cube, cubic in out of that. Yeah, I think so. Is that a good one? Sure. Yeah, sure. And uh, that's an async method, so we're gonna we're gonna do some async. So, so that native control is not the it's Oops. not the uh, it's not like the Android control. It's the it's the Xamarin it's, Forms control. Yes, which is itself in some ways a wrapper, a wrapper uh, around, uh, yeah. of itself. But yeah, but this ends up talking to you know the the well as I don't have to explain it to you, of course, because you know, so you could probably explain it better than I can. James. Yeah, I mean, so there's there's a there's a so what's being displayed. If you pull up your emulator right now, what's being displayed on there are native Android controls, and in the Xamarin forms, it abstracts those into a common common API and adds properties that have data binding and a bunch of good stuff. All those things that you saw that progress, that progress color, those may not exist on every single platform. So they abstract it into a common common API, and it's it's sort of like a shim pass through down so so xamarin forms handles all the layout and how you do grids and the stack layout things like that um, and then it just displays a native control so what you see is a native button and and that click event just gets propagated up to xamarin forms which is getting passed through into um into the the mobile bindings here yeah that's exactly what i was going to say yeah and yep. as jam jam it says that's pretty cool that's yep. pretty cool so uh let's go ahead and set, let's set a break point uh in the actually let's, uh, let's set Let's set, let's set two breakpoints. Let's go wild. Here. I love breakpoints. Break, breakpoints are free. I'll just set as many as I want. <laughs> uh, let's uh, get the debugger attached Break, here. There should be a Visual Studio thing. Breakpoint all lines. <laughs> and just every line. And... So let's get this uh, running. So I added, uh, so the, pro- the progress bar is still there. I added an additional button uh, to, to kind of co- complete the progress uh, kind of instantly with a mm-hmm. little uh, animation. The animation might not show up uh, too well over the video because it, it's, I think, kind of a, a fairly quick animation. Uh, so we can uh, hit that button there. And so uh, we've got the breakpoint. So the app counter is currently, oh, I don't know why it's not showing. Oh, I guess maybe it's, why isn't it showing? Why isn't it showing? Oh, because it's, is it not a public member? Why is it? Why? Oh, there it is. Oh, was it, was it there? Did it, did it just like take a second? Yeah, it just took a second. Oh, no, it didn't. No, no, it's just, it's just dot, dot, dot. It's just an integer. Hmm. How funny is that? Hmm. Yeah. What if you do app state dot counter? Yeah, how funny is that? It even kind of just says like type here. That's kind of weird. Magic. Yeah. <laughs> and it still works. <laughs> yeah, it it does work though. Blazer. Yeah, Blazer. It still works. Yeah. Uh, so so I'll, I'll I'll take off that break one because I'm going to press the button a whole bunch of times. I don't want to kind of step into the debugger every single every single time. So we see the the, the progress bar incrementing just as it did before. And now when I hit complete. We have uh, this uh, this line, this breakpoint get called, and then well, okay, the, we kind of missed it, but um, so yeah, I don't know if I can. Well, yeah, it's going to be hard to see the animation well, once that's there. But trust me, it animated uh, the the progress bar. So this is a, a great way to kind of see that this this does not replace Xamarin Forms by any means. This this quite the contrary. It 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 uses Xamarin Forms and it exposes Xamarin Forms because to do things like animations, there's not really a, a, a 
blazer syntax for animations or anything like that, nor, nor do I necessarily think there even should be. Uh, which what you really want to do for animations is talk to those native components and say like, hey, Xamarin Forms, you know how to talk to Android, you know how to talk to iOS, you know how to talk to UWP. I want to do this animation with all the built-in logic, the best way to render things. You do it and, and talk to the, to the OS rendering layer and you know, do the right calls to make all that stuff happen. Mm. So in, in literally just minutes, we, we authored a new component, got it built in uh, mobile Blazor bindings, and then uh, used it in an application. What about like all the, you know, existing con controls that are out there, custom third-party controls from, for Xamarin Forms already? Because really, if you think about it, like you just kind of considered these as, Xam as, as third-party controls to you, right? Mm -hmm. But if there was a popular library out there that maybe... Oh, like say Pancake View? I do like pancakes. Yeah, you love Pancake I View. I mean, I'm a what? waffle guy, but you know... What is a waffle but a pancake that got run over? Or it has abs. Oh. A, a lot of abs. <laughs> we were on holiday and I went abs. to this uh, waffle, waffle <laughs> truck and it was like uh, waffles, pancakes, but with abs. And it was pretty, it was like nice. this... Like, Beefed up, <laughs> As a dad, I will I will use that yeah. joke from now on. The, the the here's the problem with, with waffles. I mean, I love waffles. They're one of my favorite. Okay, uh, is everybody foods. listening is gonna be gonna be deep. So the only thing is, you know, you got to store. Everyone stores pots and pans underneath the oven. Yeah. But mm -hmm. where do you store the pancake or the waffle iron? The waffle mm -hmm. iron once big. One you probably have like four of them. I mean, just in, I mean, if you don't, I mean, come on. You need a Belgian one. You need a round one. You need a Death Star one, um, a BB-8 one. I mean, come on. Of course, of course, obviously. This is this is assumed. This right? is common sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then you know, if you're in a small apartment like I'm in Seattle, you get it's like up there, right? It's like the rice cooker that you box. So I'm gonna make rice all the time, and you got it's up there, and you got to get it down, and you got to wash it. So besides that, in all aspects of life, waffles are better. But except for that one, so part, where where do you keep your waffle irons? It's above the fridge. Hmm. Is it a really tall fridge, or is it kind of easy to get to? It's kind of easy. Stool? Uh, you need. I can get to it. Um, but other family but, members might correct. Might need some. They might need some assistance. Vertical assistance. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only problem. Hmm. But beyond that, waffles are the go to. So, are you going to author a waffle view component? No, I refuse. Oh, I don't want. I don't want to spark that. I've already sparked the debate already. We all know waffles win. But well, for the five um, remaining viewers, um, yeah. what it, what is said pancake view, sir? So uh, yeah, so the, the component generator I've written. Um, there's nothing very specific. To, it is currently kind of hard coded to only what's built into Xamarin Forms, mm. but with probably a few lines of code, somebody could uh, easily extend it or kind of hard code it themselves to. Mm. Uh, different assembly. Now, I haven't tried that yet because, like I said, it was 1 a.m. this morning when I kind of got it finally working and producing the right code. Um, I did manually write a wrapper for a popular uh, third-party component that's available on Nougat.org uh, called Pancake View, and so I wrote a wrapper for it called huh. Microsoft Mobile Blazor Bindings. Pancake View. So, qu question: Without having done it, theoretically, does it seem like the way that you're building your bindings from that text file? would work against pancake view because it's doing reflection and finding out what the exposed properties and stuff are. Yeah, one, the the probably the trickiest thing is anytime there's anything a little bit custom. Um, and so uh, controls that have uh, inner nested contents. And so for example, mm -hmm. like uh, actually let, let me show what, what something like that looks like. So something like progress bar is pretty straightforward. It really, it doesn't have any events. It just has some properties and it just kind of does its thing. You just say like, I want you to look like this, look like that. And, and, and here you go. Um, but several of these files here, you can see some, some of these files have like a dot generated and a not dot generated. So let's take a look, for example, at stack layout. So stack layout, I was able to auto generate most of it, but I still had to m manually write just a few lines to indicate that stack layout supports inner contents. And so stack layout supports some child content and that's declared via this property, which is a, mm -hmm. or it's a regular Blazor property. This is the parameter that any, anybody who's done Blazor before is familiar with this uh, parameter attribute. And then it has a get child content method that returns that child content. So most of stack layout is auto-generated, but I had to add a little bit of functionality. But several components here, for example, uh, span, um, tab, tab bar, tab page, I was able to uh, fully auto-generate them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Pancake View, from what I've seen, probably most of it can be auto-generated. It does support inner content, and so uh, one would have to add 
um, just a, a little bit of code like this, because these are all generated as partial classes. So you can have kind of your auto-generated part and uh, your manually written part. This is kind of a common technique with code generators. Mm -hmm. And then um, I believe there was a couple other uh, special things with Pancake View that I didn't even bother manually writing for the sake of this uh, kind of demonstration, is it supports, um, I forget what it was, like a, a list of... A list of gradient stops. A list of gradient stops. That's so if people don't know what Pancake View is, it's a magical con um, magical view by one of our amazing MVPs, Stephen Thwyson, uh, who allows you to do like cards and rounded corners and checkered corners and gradients and backdrops and all sorts of things. And it works on iOS, Android, and Windows. It's, it's very magical. I use it everywhere. It's my most favorite thing in the entire world. Um, it, it's great. Yeah, I think I can uh, have the, I get you like surprise. I, I demoed it at .NET Conf um, doing a weather application. So these, uh, these like little. Oh, um, so similar to this one. Yeah, so th these are little pancake views here. These yeah. little, uh, teardrops. These little things, these little teardrops. And then also the, the whole background with the gradient is itself a, a pancake view as well. Um, yeah, so for example, yeah, so it has this uh, property called background gradient stops, which is commented out here, which is an enumerable of gradient stop. Representing that in a Blazor is definitely doable. It's just a little tricky and it's very difficult to mm. do automatically. Now, having said that, I'm going to try because the more things I can make auto generatable, uh, the better. Uh, because if, if <laughs> even the parts where I had to kind of split code into the auto generated half and the manually written half, I kind of I really didn't want to write that manual half after yeah. I'd spent so much time doing the generator. You know what? This looks very similar to me. Um, uh, so a lot of people, when they were coming in, they're asking like, "These, what are these controls? What are this about?" Right? I saw someone do Bootstrap for Blazor components. Mm -hmm. So normally, mm -hmm. uh, when you do Bootstrap, there's like class styles, right? Uh, but somebody basically created their own components around every single Bootstrap thing. Mm -hmm. So you could just say, mm -hmm. "Give me a card," right? Instead of doing the class names. So you can sort of think of yeah. like, that's sort of what this is to that, which yeah. is a very similar paradigm for custom components in Blazor already. Yeah, absolutely. You all this stuff. And yeah, that's really kind of a powerful thing. And I that kind of happened later. So first of all, Blazor came out and it was like, check it out, WebAssembly with .NET. That's crazy. And then as a result, over time, if you're building anything like any kind of spa that's doing actually anything, you need a component model. And also comparing it with like, Angular and React, like everybody had a good component model. And so that's something that Steve and the other devs on the, the Blazor team are really good at is like looking at what's what's the state of the art with components and then let's, you know, do all that and more. And so I think now the component model is actually the compelling thing in Blazor. And so it's cool that you're basically like tapping into the component model with these components as well, right? So as you're pointing out, James, to exposing the bootstrap things as components and here this is also exposing xamarin form elements as blazor components like that's it's a nice simple model to work with yeah totally cool. <laughs> uh, so i just got a couple of more things to kind of wrap up uh, what i've got here is uh, so we saw you know so that, that progress bar component i'll uh, probably check that in later today unless i have to I, I probably have to go pick up my son from daycare but uh, tonight at uh, i don't know 1 a.m. Yeah, I'll, I'll check in the, the progress bar component. Uh, and so uh, in addition to that, just fixed all kinds of bugs. So like said, thanks to the generator and community PRs, uh, added some missing properties on various components. So uh, some of that was from community pull requests. Some of that I did myself. Uh, fixed some other bugs where properties got unset and they would default to the wrong value. And then like I showed earlier, you can get to the native uh, Xamarin Forms uh, control from the Blazor component very easily. So just type dot .native control and, and you get access to that. So you can call those APIs uh, directly. Uh, and then we'd love to hear again from the community kind of what what would what would folks like to, to do or what, anything they want to share. I've seen lots of tweets. Uh, Uno uh, got, some, got some stuff running with mobile Blazor bindings uh, running on the web or something. It was something wild. I don't remember what it was. And then uh, somebody had uh, talked about getting some uh, unit testing library or some kind of testing library working mm -hmm. with mobile Blazor bindings, which was uh, also really cool. So it was great that within, that was all I think within a week of, of uh, something that people hadn't even seen before, just seeing this kind of great uh, community activity around this. And then uh, all these updates that we're working on, hopefully kind of within a week or so, we'll get uh, another update out to nougat.org. Uh, we'll try to kind of whip together a blog post, send out some tweets, let everybody know about that. 
And uh, oh, last thing I want to show is uh, uh, David Ortenau, who's uh, one of the program managers who works on this as well, sent out a uh, a, a, a Twitter poll, a tw Twitter poll, whatever. Poll, a, a Twitter poll. A poll. Yeah. Twitter, poll. A poll. Twitter poll. Twitter poll. Twitter poll. Twitter poll. Twitter poll. A tuple. 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 Oh, oh boy. No. Tuple. Oh, no. tuple. <laughs> oh dear. The tuple of tuples. Anyway, so uh, he asked. If you have a tuple of a multi tuple. A truple. A truple. <laughs> Do you use truple oil? <laughs> truffle oil? Trup, trup, trup. That's all the time we have this yeah. week. Anyway, okay, so I, I just want to show this, uh, this uh, Twitter poll that uh, uh, David uh, sent out uh, just a couple days ago. And uh, kind of asking what would folks like to see uh, for uh, what kind of app model would they like to see uh, for uh, for building mobile apps, uh, cross platform apps, actually, I should say. And uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, there were thousands of responses and the, the poll just closed, I think, uh, earlier today or yesterday. And uh, it's, it's no surprise to see XAML, uh, of course, very popular. But Blazor also uh, actually, you know, you know, kind of slightly edged out. Uh, now th this this doesn't, you know, um, it's, it's a Twitter poll. It's not scientific, but it's kind of great to see the the, the excitement out there and that there is some interest uh, in folks kind of seeing stuff like this. So I'm going to keep working on this uh, and get some updates out there. And uh, based on feedback, we'll we'll keep iterating and, and sharing more uh, as we make progress. Yeah, you know, when I saw this poll come out, it, it sort of made a lot of sense to me in a way because. There's web developers and client developers, right? And there's, I mean, even if you're building for the same thing, the, the paradigms, right, uh, call to you, right? I think uh, so. So this poll being like fifty-ish, fifty percent in some ways, the co combined forces make, makes quite a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, and I think the, the 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 number of web developers is a larger number than the number of mobile developers uh, out there, at least certainly within the .NET platform, which is kind of a lot of probably who's re responding to this because they're probably using .NET if they're using XAML or or Blazor or Comet, and so. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, just seeing, you know, it's, it's fairly even, I, I agree, um, yeah. kind of between those two and that uh, there's, we know there's a lot of people excited about XAML and there's a, a lot of people excited about Blazor. Where do people go for, for this? Oh, yes. Does it live on the internet somewhere? Boom. Yeah. Oh, oh there uh, it is. Just, yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, so check out the, the GitHub repo. Uh, so Xamarin slash mobile Blazor bindings and then uh, Twitter follow uh, uh, David, James, and myself. Uh, and then the amazing hashtag mobile Blazor bindings, which has like, I think like three nice <laughs> three, three tweets on it all uh, by you <laughs> uh yeah, two out of three i think nice. probably uh so uh, let's let's make it a thing um yeah so yeah ch ch check those out uh you know file issues start discussions uh and, and you know send tweets and and uh let's let's get stuff out there it was fun i think the f the first time i sat down i was like okay how do i how to make a, mo a list of monkeys and i got to work in yeah and they animated yeah That's animated right. Anim wow. yeah, animated monkeys yeah, yeah. James and his monkey APIs. You have to have a monkey API or else. <laughs> now, what's your platform good for? That's true. Yeah. What you should do, though, you should save the animation for like V2. Otherwise, where do you go from there? Ooh. I mean, uh, yeah, Pete. So. <laughs> so Jeff says, absolutely amazing. Um, think about writing their first mobile app with it. Very cool. If you have any questions, we, we have a little bit of time left so people can, because we started late. There's a. Uh, there's debates versus waffle versus pancakes, which makes a lot of sense. John, do you have any questions? You're a, you're a, you're a ASP.NET developer. No? No, I mean, this was really interesting to see kind of walk through here. Um, gosh, I, I honestly don't. I just want to play with it. You should go do that. <laughs> Live stream right now. Oh, boom. There we go. <laughs> download, the, download the preview. Uh, so Blizzard Mr. Magoo asks, well, specifically, what, where does it work today? Yeah, uh, what, like what platforms is that the yep. question? Yeah, so um, the project templates that you can install, and there's inst if you go to uh, that that URL, you, it'll take you to the doc site. It'll tell you how to install the project templates. Uh, there are project templates for iOS and Android. Um, and I think there's actually a bug right now with the, I the iOS, so it, it has some issues, but you can run Android on Windows or Android on uh, on your Mac, so that, that works really well. Um, somebody has uh, one of the community pull requests that we have uh, open right now is uh, somebody adding a UWP uh, backend project to one of the sample apps. Uh, Xamarin Forms runs great on UWP as well. And so for a long time, I kept saying, like, no reason it shouldn't work. And somebody proved that uh, apparently, yeah, it does work. And so uh, we'll also uh, end up adding um, a 
project template option to create a UWP uh, backend for that as well. So you can use mobile Blazor bindings, not only for iOS and Android, but also for UWP applications. So it does work. It's just there's no template for it right now. Yeah, so kind of it could go wherever Xamarin Forms works today. Yeah, absolutely. And then yeah. uh, in the future, uh, you know, the Surface uh, Duo, is that the one? Duo. Duo. Neo. Neo's the tablet. The, oh, uh, the Duo. Uh, Duo. Duo is Android based. Well, yeah, okay, that one. And yeah. then, yeah, then Neo is Windows based. Is, so it's is, a UWP. Is that, is, that a wa- is that a pancake? A waffle? What is, what is that? A foldable. A foldable waffle. Foldable. Oh, like a waffle oh. that you haven't cut. Oh, you know what it is? It's like, you know, when you um, when you get a waffle, but then you put something inside of it and then you, you fold it on top of itself and smush it down. Is that a sandwich? Yeah. Um, so someone was asked about documentation. When you go to this link right here, there's a docs link to docs.microsoft.com slash mobile dash blazers dash bindings. Short URL. I'm sure that John right now will just type it right into the chat room and make it happen. Yeah, I've to... already added it to the community link. Wow, for the week, by the way. amazing! Some, some yeah, do, it says docs. And then, That's where it. can people go to learn about the different Xamarin components? Great question. Yeah, you can go to. Wow, look at this! It's I already think, there. Uh, I think there's a. Uh, uh, um, um, um. But is that auto generated from your? Uh... That's true. Are the docs automatically updated when you run your generator? Well, you could just go learn the the Xamarin controls. You go to the Xamarin docs. Yes, it should right. be linked. Um, I think there's I think there's a link from somewhere somewhere in here. In there, it's in there. Yeah, here. There's 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 probably a link somewhere. But yeah, well, uh, yeah, just check just search for Xamarin forums components, um, and you'll you'll find the, there's there's really great docs. I had to read a lot of those docs to understand for myself how to use a lot of these components. I'm yeah. I'm fairly new to uh, mobile development. I'm I, I have a web background, not not mobile. So I had to learn that as well, but uh, well, that, that's, that's great feedback. If it's, it's if it's not easy to find, we'll make sure that it's easy to find. So Jeep was asking from YouTube, um, can they use similar web tags like div? We've talked about this earlier, but like maybe like an H1 or something like that, or is that is that not that's not there? Yeah, so there? so that that's that's definitely not there uh, right now. It's something that kind of within the team, some of us have, have talked about. You know, wouldn't it be neat if I could say you know something like uh, div? Now this isn't this wouldn't be an HTML div. This would be a mobile blazer. Uh, component named div that mm. maybe it's really just a stack layout, but mm. instead of having uh, something like an orientation property that's of type uh, stack or yeah, the stack uh-huh. orientation enum, uh, maybe it has something uh, you know some kind of we maybe fa- fake some things that kind of look like CSS or maybe are CSS. In fact, you can use some CSS features uh, in in here as mm-hmm. well, which is obviously familiar to web developers. But you could imagine we might have something like this, and and maybe input type equals. Uh, input type equals text, mm. you know, uh, with, with, with a value property or something like that. Uh, we don't have that right now. It's something we thought uh, might be fun to play with and see, you know, it's not HTML, but it's something that might kind of look like HTML and feel very natural um, and kind of even behave uh, not exactly the same, but very similar uh, to what people might be familiar with. But we don't have that right now, but it's great to hear that people at least are thinking about that kind of thing because that, that's what motivates us to kind of... It, keep the experiment going and, and, and try it in a few different directions. Yeah, so go write issues and comment on issues and write a spec or proposal. I love when uh, yeah. I, I see what Emo's always doing, they have the C-sharp and done in standard things and here's an idea, let me tell you why I want this and how it would be done and yeah, you know, X, Y, Z. I, I don't think there's uh, an issue logged on this right now, so if somebody wants to beat me to it, go to the GitHub repo, Xamarin slash mobile blazer bindings and, yeah. and log an issue. Like, Would it be nice to have some HTML look and feel components um, available. Some of them would be really easy to write. It's just, you know, there's going to be a hundred right now because a hundred people are going to go do it. Could be. Could could you also as well, I think what you're describing there, having like a a div that maps over to like stack, whatever it's called, stack layout. But could you also like in other cases, like wrap a web view? I don't think you have. Do you have support for WebView already? Um, I, I don't have support for WebView in here. Xamarin Forms does have a, a WebView yes. uh, component. Uh, mm-hmm. That's one that you know just hadn't gotten to it. I'll have to try my generator on it, and then you could you could do something totally crazy. You could have like a Blazor Wasm app running in a web window, running inside a mobile Blazor bindings application. Oh, come on, no. <laughs> How do you feel about that, John? <laughs> yeah, and then I, Inception. I don't know. Inception. Don't do that. I'm sorry, I asked. That's, yeah. that's oh, another not, question. Not recommended. <laughs> another question to make sure I understand correctly. This is completely like a design and build time thing. What I'm deploying to my application, I'm not like deploying any extra magical stuff. Like it's just straight up Xamarin Forms when it's deployed to the app, right? Um, or is there more stuff as well there? Well, whether there's magic depends on kind of your your 
framework of beliefs. It's um, all magic to me. <laughs> well, then yes, it is. It is all <laughs> purely magic. In fact, uh, little little gnomes inside your phone are moving, uh, you know, transistor wires around. Um, there, it is using Blazor, so uh, you can think of it as just like a Blazor WebAssembly running in the browser. This is it's not WebAssembly; uh, it's running .NET code, uh, but it's running on your device, but using the Blazor um, okay. pattern. So Blazor works based on uh, creating render trees and diffing them, and based on the diffs, it creates the element. It creates and destroys and modifies elements that did not exist in the previous iteration of the render tree, and so all that is happening. Uh, on your, you know, on your iPhone or, or Samsung Galaxy or Surface Duo, or, it's, or, in, the it's in the us. computer. It's in the computer. Okay, so that so there is there are additional libraries that are deployed, and I'm guessing they're probably relatively small. Or what's uh, like so it's, it's Blazor itself. I'm I, I'm not sure the size, um, but uh, yeah, we we should probably one thing we have not done yet is any like performance investigations or anything like that. Uh, it's it's kind of a little early in the project. Uh, I felt yeah. to to spend too much time on that, uh, but that is an open question and see kind of what what are the different sizes, but. Um, you know, kind of having a, a good experience where you have good performance, good download size, uh, memory consumption, all these things. These are all things that we have to look into. And that's all that's long been something that's been super important for Xamarin and Xamarin mm -hmm. forums. And then that's something that would continue uh, here as well, because we want everybody to have a, a great experience. If it's maybe a great programming model, but you can only build really slow, chunky apps, that's, you know, that's. That's not so interesting. Not so good. Yeah, and like uh, Michael in the chat was asking about the shaken tree. So we have our own the Xamarin team. When you build an iOS and Android app with .NET or or watch application or as well, someone was asking about that. You, you wouldn't build that with a cross platform UI, but you can build a watch uh, application or a TV application for Apple mm -hmm. you know, Apple Watch and TV OS for Apple TV. Now you just wouldn't build those cross platform. You build separate UIs. It's a little tiny thing. It, we don't have like a. It doesn't go down there. But so the, each of those have their own linker optimizer um, optimizers and compilers. And of course, they're running the .NET runtime, which is going to be tree shaken down. So you violently shake that tree until all that code falls off. Um, and, and you can control, is it, a, is, it a, is it like a light shake or is it an aggressive shake mm -hmm. of the tree, you know, um, of, of code? And um, so that will shrink it down. So usually like a, a normal Xamarin application is, is, is just the, the code that you're using plus a few megs here and there for the runtime and any DLLs that you're using. So um, yeah, most likely the, the Blazor stuff is not adding a lot, just adding on top of the, the so there's gonna be, there's, there's a library on top of it, right? But everything is then tree shooken down. So it shouldn't really be a huge, yep. um, a huge thing. But that's it, you made a great point that I wanted to bring out too is that when you think about like there's Blazor server, which is like the code's running on this, the server, right? Compared to like, and that always blew my mind because when I first built my first website, I don't, I didn't understand how the internet works. So my wife, who's a web developer, had to explain to me how the internet works. She's like, no, it's, it's happening up to, I was like, no, but I click this button, it, it should happen there. She's like, no, that's not how the internet works. I was like, oh my God, my mind's blown. Because <laughs> like I'm a mobile developer and client developer, so I'm like, it happens on the thing. So when you build right. a mobile app, even with this, it has a similar paradigm to Blazor WebAssembly, which it's happening, yep. it would be happening in the browser, but it's happening in the mobile device, right? Everything there. The difference is that this is not using the the WASM or the interpreter. It, it's Correct. using the normal Xamarin runtime, yep. the .NET runtime that's there. So yep. you're, yeah, like, you're good one-to-one -one performance um, in general, so. Yep. Yeah, and, and since it's, you know, an iOS is fully ahead of time compiled, the perf is, negligible because everything's ahead of time compiled. In fact, on Android, we ahead of time compile apps too. So really, perf comes down to being one to one almost. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's my Xamarin, wow. that's my Xamarin fun fact of the day. Da -da -da -da. Shaking trees. <laughs> I mean, that's the only analogy I could think of. of um, yeah, but I mean, J John, it's also something you mentioned earlier because you're talking about um, the uh, Blazor Wasm uh, 3.2 preview one that came out and that uh, from mm -hmm. uh, Dan Roth's blog post that they, you know, they, they saved another hundred kilobytes and, you know, it's, it's, you just chip away at, at, at it with re removing anything that doesn't have to be there. And so, yes, it is adding some things to have Blazor, but um, 
it's in some cases it's in place of other things. So it might be in place of some uh, some XAML components that you might have or some logic that's there. Uh, but it's also bringing in some additional things that might be things that you might want anyways. For example, support from Microsoft.extensions.dependency injection, which is a fairly popular library in its own right. Yeah. Uh, or things like uh, logging and configuration that, again, might be things that people want to use anyway. And so while, yes, it does... Uh, mandate bringing those in, those might be things that you wanted to use anyway, or this might be the motivation somebody needs to start using these libraries to make their development experience uh, smoother, easier. Um, they have to kind of think less about what they're doing. They can, they can solve their business problems and not worry about how do I do dependency injection. Yeah, yeah, less custom code or less kind of cobbled together a bunch of maybe overlapping dependencies. Here you have the .NET frame, or you, you have .NET Core, which has all this stuff kind of all provided for you. Yeah. So. Tr tried and true. One one question too, because there's some questions about like, oh, what if you just you know, what if you just built a mobile app and did a, a you know, WASM or you did just a website, right? And and that always comes down to me native look and feel, but also native APIs. You didn't even talk about accessing native APIs at all. Yeah, um, you have access to native APIs. Well, how? Um, well, you're the expert on that, James. You, 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 well, so that's the beautiful part about Xamarin is being built on top of Xamarin is that they're available inside of C Sharp, all of them. And yep. you can use awesome libraries like Xamarin Essentials that give you access to all, not all, but like 60, 70, 80 different um, native APIs from a cross-platform API that you could use in that code block. Oh, yeah. That's, you know, actually, I don't have a sample of that in here. That's something that I showed wow. at, at, <laughs> at, at .NET yeah. Conf. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do have a sample here of, of talking directly to the uh, speech APIs. So you could also use dependency injection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this uses this sample uses dependency injection. Apparently, I think mm -hmm. Xamarin Essentials has now a text to speech. That's uh, correct. I copied this apparently from a sample that perhaps needs to be updated. Yeah. Uh, I think that one is like here's how you use dependency injection, but then like you don't need to use that anymore because we already d already did it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, it's, so here's how you would do it if you needed to. In this particular case of text to speech, this is the iOS version. This is the Android version. This is talking to this is talking to Android, Android. APIs, yeah. and this one is talking to iOS APIs in C sharp. From C sharp, yeah, I've not written any native code whatsoever. It's just these are these are .NET projects, and then I have an interface that I wrote uh, that I that I use from within my application that I stole from a sample probably, um, and you know I, I changed the namespace to to match what nice. I wanted. Um, and that's my contribution, and uh, this is certainly one way to do that. But you know, the, the, the best way, wherever you can, which is more and more cases every day, is Xamarin Essentials, which mm -hmm. lets you uh, use uh, geolocation and uh, GPS and um, camera and phone dialers and web browsers and gosh. All, the, all the things that you need to do on a all of them. It might be the essential things you need to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the critical, critical, Xamarin dot critical, critical, yeah. <laughs> dot criti yeah. critical. Yeah. Well, look, it's after five p.m. California West Coast time, so it's quitting time. AKA John is sick of the terrible humor on this side <laughs> of like, team yeah. chat. I have to pick up my son from daycare. So, all right, cool. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the bells, do the things. Thanks, John. All right, all right, bye. Thanks everybody.